development in the brain. So I'm, I'm more concerned that the brain come away with something. It, it makes some times for an intense curriculum, but in the end, they're thankful for it. That's been my experience. Has everyone seen the balloon in liquid nitrogen? I have a balloon here that's been inflated with pure carbon dioxide. See, I have a piece of dry ice in there. And dry ice is uh, solidified carbon dioxide. It's at minus, it, it's a, it sublimates at minus 79. So now what happens if I take something that's turned into a solid at minus 79 into a liquid, if I pour it into a liquid that boils at 196, negative 196. You may think, well, if something's boiling, how can it be cold? Well, <laughs> it's cold because it's boiled at a sub-zero temperature. It's kind of a hard concept to grasp, so it's first in our way. Oh, it's a cold. It's a cold. It takes a few seconds, though. That's what they use for burning wood off. If you have the skin, the warts or anything, the growth on the skin, they drip this on it. It freezes the skin. When the skin is damaged, your body kills it. And it gets it turns black and falls off. Uh, what was I doing? I need a balloon now. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Let's get this on the side. Yeah, post it. Yeah, I'll show it to you in class tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so this is gas at room temperature. It's holding the balloon inflated. And now, what happens when it touches liquid nitrogen at minus 196? The, the kinetic energy of the molecules decreases, so the molecules are slow, moving slow and slow. Right now, air molecules, the, the air molecules that are in this room are moving around three or 400 meters per second. So they're moving at the speed of a rifle bullet. Of course, they're very small, so uh, they don't penetrate anything, but that's the reason we feel um, air pressure. Now, we don't feel air pressure because the pressure is the same on both sides of our body. But if I was to suddenly be elevated to the top of Mount Everest at 29,000 feet, the air pressure there is only one-third of what it is at, at, the, at, the, at the surface of the Earth, it would certainly do me some damage because the pressure difference between inside my body and outside my body would be too large. What's happening here is the air molecules are slowing down the colder they get. If I could somehow lower the temperature of the air in, the, in this balloon to minus 273 degrees Celsius, then all molecular motion would stop in the air of that balloon. That's what we call absolute zero. At absolute zero, there's no more energy left in the material. So it doesn't move anymore. If you could look with a super powerful microscope at the molecules of something that's at minus 273 degrees, you would see that there's no motion. The molecules aren't even quivering. On the other hand, if you looked at this table under a super powerful microscope that, you could, make, that could make you see atoms, you would see that the atoms actually shake in place. Because even at room temperature, even though it looks like a solid, the molecules are quivering in place because they all have some heat energy in them. That, that motion stops completely at absolute zero. And minus 196 is getting pretty close. You have only about 80 degrees left to go before you have absolutely no energy left in the solid. But you can see that this balloon has lost so much energy that the air inside of it is no longer able to inflate it. Now if I pull it out, the air molecules are going to start warming up, and they're going to want to expand. They're going to start exerting pressure. But the latex that the balloon is made of is not going to be able to keep up. So the balloon is going to try to expand, but it's got no, it's got no, uh, it's got no elasticity at this temperature, so it pops. You said, is the air correct? Am I correct? That looks good. This? No, the wet stuff. Yeah. The big stuff. Oh, this is the dry ice. This is at minus 79. Now, I shouldn't be handling it with bare hands, but if I keep no. on moving it around, um, oh, no. it'll be okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put one piece inside the balloon. If I can do it, perhaps I need an assistant. If you could uh, kindly hold the balloon open while I stuff a piece of ice in, and then we'll close it. Ouch. Okay, good. See, it froze my finger a little bit. We're going to let it... Fire? 
Oh, cool. If we can help it along a bit. You warm it up, it produces a lot more CO2 much more quickly. Let's see if the balloon doesn't pop. So I've got some boiling water on the outside, and I've got dry ice on the inside, so I'm adding a lot of energy to it. And that dry ice is sublimating, meaning it's turning directly from a solid into a gas. Actually, sublimation, they use the same term. Whether you turn a, a, a gas into a directly into a solid or a solid directly into a gas, it's still called sublimation. So I'm sublimating this dry ice and I'm filling this balloon with carbon dioxide. So there's pure carbon dioxide in here. Now if I was to subject it to those sub-zero temperatures, you'll see that the dry ice will form a, a, a sort of coating on the, on the inside of the balloon. It will resublimate the back on the inside of the balloon. So notice the pressure drops immediately. You see the white stuff there? That's the dry ice frozen on the inside of the balloon. Mars does the same thing. If you ever look at Mars, Mars has some ice caps. If you look at it through a telescope in the winter time. Those ice caps aren't made of water. They're made of dry. They're made of dry ice. It's carbon dioxide freezing on the polar ice caps of Mars because the temperature drops low enough to actually do that to freeze it right out of the air. Now I can try doing this again just to show you the brittleness of metal. This is regular steel. Uh, if you hammer it all you like. And all that's going to happen is, you look, all going to happen is it's going to deform. But what if I chill it to minus 196? The what is not fine. What is that? This is liquid nitrogen. The same gas that you breathe in the air, except it's at minus 196. So it turns into a liquid at that temperature. If you take the thermometer, watch. The thermometer goes to minus 20. Okay? See this? When the mercury is, uh, actually this is not mercury, it's your alcohol thermometer, but Oh, this one's damaged. Yeah, this one can see it more clear. When it gets down to here, there, it means the temperature is minus 20. Look what happens when I stick it in there. It's going down. Oh, I can actually see it more. Oh, it is going down. Look how fast it's dropping. It drops 30, minus 40, minus 50. It's really cold. The thermometer doesn't go below that. Minus 100. Right? This thermometer won't tell you what temperature it is because it can't go below minus 50. So now, in the meantime, our piece of metal has become completely frozen at minus 196. Now, you're used to seeing metal at room temperature and how it can take a beating and it can bend, it can flex. But metal at 196 is a different animal. It undergoes what's called embrittlement. It becomes glassy in its properties. So keep your eyes below the level of this shield, okay? okay. Now it's broken. Okay. So it's broke. Before I hammered it, you saw it bent a little bit. This time it just snapped like a piece of glass. Because the, uh, the molecules don't have any more, uh, anywhere near as much movement. So when I tried to stress the metal and bend it a bit, it wouldn't accept the bending. So it just snaps and the bond breaks. Now I can show you what happens to rubber when you chill it to those sub-zero temperatures. They use liquid nitrogen when they want to, uh, if they want to fit two really uh, tight parts together. Say if they want to put a shaft inside of a gear and the gear, the hole in the gear is just a little too small. What they do is they freeze the shaft part. It gets smaller when it's cold. They put it in, when it warms up, it's so tight that you don't even have to weld it. It fits there, they can't take it out anymore unless they were to uh, cut it off. So now I'm gonna chill that. <laughs> now this, this piece of metal is so hot compared to that gas, to that liquid um, nitrogen, that it, uh, it comes whistling up with it. It's making my fingers stick to it. So one half of it is getting really cold, the elastic is getting really chilled, while the other half is still at room temperature. So when I take it off, this top part snaps back into place, the other one stays extended. The rubber, the rubber is no longer able to work like normal rubber until it warms up again. Slowly as it warms up, you see that it goes back to its normal shape. Because rubber molecules are actually all twisted like spaghetti, they're all, they're all tangled up. When you stretch them, they, 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 sort of sp they sort of strain out like that. If you ever take a thread and you twist it, the more you twist it, the thread forms little kinks, mm. and then it kinks, the kinks get kinked even more, 
and it, and, it, and it all super coils. But when you pull on it, all the coils sort of stretch out, and that's what gives the rubber its flexibility. What class is this? Chemistry. Sign up for it. <laughs> I recommend it. <laughs> Let's try our marshmallow. We haven't tried the marshmallow yet. Where's the marshmallow? Is it cold? Cold. Cold. Super cold. Well, that's not super cold. Yeah. Right. Take your hand and put it in there for five minutes. Can you, can you go like this? Sure. Your finger is shut up. Josh, do that. I like my job. <laughs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> you can't they didn't even want to sell it to me. I had to. I have to badger them to get me to sell it. Are you really? Yeah. I, I, I had to try three different vendors, and I said, look, I promise not to swim in it. Let yeah. me have it. I promise I won't put any students in it. <laughs> and you finally let me have it. Do you have a contract? No. Private city. They finally let me buy it by myself. So it's pretty cold now, but let's give it a bit more, because marshmallows are pretty well insulated. If you touch the sides of this container, you'll notice it's not even really cold. Why? Because the, uh, the styrofoam is a very good insulator. Okay, let's see what happens. Mm. Okay. This is so good. Uh, <laughs> this is the inside is still sticky, but it embrittles everything. Earlier I tried to do a demo with some alcohol that I had. If you ever tried well, if you ever try ice beer, what they do with ice beer is similar to what I've done here. This is some uh, homemade grappa that I had. Italians like to make uh, home, homemade alcohol. I got and what I had I had some home homemade alcohol and I froze it, but my mason jar cracked. So now all my alcohol froze completely solid. But what you can do, what they do in um, places... Italians make, Italian make it? Yeah, Italians like to make it. They take old wine that's spoiled, and you boil it, and the alcohol forms a vapor, and then when the vapor passes through a coil, it recondenses, and then you have 40% alcohol. It becomes like whiskey. It's Which not one? very good. It doesn't taste that great. <laughs> but it's, it's very strong, and it's good for making, uh, you know, different mint in it, and it can make a tasty aperitif. It's the thing that you have a little sip of before you have dinner. At any rate... Uh, what they do when they make ice beer is they freeze the cheap beer. Sometimes they have cheap beer that they can't sell. So what they do is they freeze it all, and all the all the bad stuff comes out of it at the lower temperatures, and it increases the alcohol content because the water freezes before the alcohol does. And then they sell it as ice beer. But you, whenever you buy ice beer, what they're doing is they're selling you all the stuff that they would have to throw away <laughs> if they didn't freeze it. <laughs> that's, I know. That's what chemists are for. They think up of these things so people don't waste their money. Yes. Oh, that's my uh, Jacob's ladder. You want to see the Jacob's ladder? Yeah. Hit the lights, please. Please don't get closer than where you are now. Hey, hit the lights again, because I can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> now you can hit the lights. Oh. That's called a Jacob's ladder. That's the transformer that generates about 15,000 volts from a house, uh, regular household current. And uh, when you generate 15,000 volts, it actually breaks down the air. It's like a, light, like a mini lightning bolt. The energy in the electrons is so high that it actually strips the electrons from the air molecules and it makes a path to the other electrons. So that, that spark you see is a plasma, so a quartz state of matter. You've, you've heard of liquids, you've heard of solids, you've heard of gases, you can hit the lights again. Uh, now that's a plasma, it's like a lightning bolt. Same idea as a lightning bolt. Lightning bolt passive electrons, yes. What happens with the second? You'll get a very nasty shock. Like a physics? Yes. It works. Like a physics. Yeah. It's actually about the same voltage as the physics. Dying. And if it goes through if it goes through your heart, then it kills you. So I would recommend they use this for model lights. If you want to if you want to light a whole bunch of lights like this, a whole bank of lights, use one of those transformers. Because you have to uh, pass a lot of volts through um, through gases to strip away the electrons and make them light. Hmm? Yeah, the coat hangers. Coat hangers and just put them close together so the electricity wouldn't have to jump too far. If you ever listen under power lines, if you get to the, the big power lines on the big pylon, you can you can actually hear because they're pumping electricity through there about 250,000 volts. 
Oh, they're always humming. They, and the yeah. electricity has so much high voltage that the electrons actually want to come out of the wire. You can actually hear them buzzing sometimes. That's called a corona effect. Some of the electrons actually leak out of the wire because they have so much energy. The next time you're under power lines, listen carefully. You'll hear the, the light buzzing sound. And it's the same effect as that. If I do the same thing here, if I, if I separate the wires a little bit, you'll hear like a very light buzzing sound, but it won't make a spark. And that's called a corona effect. And I, I remember talking to a lineman once. I met somebody at McDonald's who, who worked on those high tension wires. He said, when you go up to those wires, you can't wear any metal. Because the current, the magnetic field is so intense around the wires, it actually warms up the buttons. Your buttons yeah, get hot. Burn. They start, they start burn. to burn you. So you have to wear all, only uh, cotton or all fabric overalls. Yeah, there's, there's special stoves now that use induction. Induction. Yeah. I have one more last demo I can show you. This is a uh, this is a torch with a barbecue. Plumbers like to use this. And I have here copper sulfate, which is uh, salt. And different substances, different elements, when you heat them to a high temperature, give off different colors of light. This is a See the green? Okay. And one interesting thing you'll notice with, um, I can show you with a penny. Some of the old pennies that we used to have were made mostly of copper. But now the new pennies are to have zinc. Pennies made after around 1981 are zinc on the inside with a with a copper coating. Oh, you got some. So if you heat them, yeah. this is one of the newer pennies. You need an old one, one sir. heat them, the zinc has a pretty low melting point. You see what you see how cheap the pennies are. Notice the green color? Mm -hmm. That's copper that's doing that. The same copper that was in this powder is also in this penny. So it'll make the same green color. Because different metals make different colors. Strontium makes red, copper makes green, sodium makes orange, wow. potassium mm -hmm. makes kind of a purplish color. So when they make fireworks and do all the different colors, is they have different types of salt in the explosive concoction. So when it explodes, if you want red, you have to put strontium salt. If you want green, you want you have to put copper salt, and so on. Anyway, let's keep on heating this penny and see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it bent it, but it didn't melt like it clicked it. Yeah, I'll try another one. I think that must be a new formulation. Usually when you heat them to a high temperature, they actually melt, and uh, the zinc comes out. Yeah. There's a characteristic green color of the copper. Okay, here we go. See that? It's bulging. All the zinc has mo uh, melted and it's gone to one side of the penny. Let's cool it off. And then come back again? No. <laughs> <laughs>
Great, we just lost a penny. <laughs> Interesting, yeah, I put in liquid nitrogen and it's still hot to the touch. Why do you think? It's, it's so hot that it forms a cushion of air around itself, so it doesn't cool down quickly. I should, have to, I should put it in water, in hot water would cool down faster. In hot water? And we have a penny where the, all the zinc has been gathered to one side because it forms a little pool melted inside the, the copper coating. So it's, the new pennies just have a copper coating on the outside and inside it's pure zinc. And zinc is cheap metal. And that's why they use it to make the new pennies. Yeah, it's still kind of cool. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you.